Well, welcome back to week two of our series, Resist the Rush. I'm so glad those of you who were able to be a part last week came back to hear more. And if you weren't here last week, I can catch you up really, really fast today. See, we're, we're in a series, obviously, talking about rush. But what we're, what we're really talking about is how to push back against the rush and the hurried pace of our world. And, and one of the things that we said last week is that rushing doesn't help us. It simply exposes that we are trying to do what is beyond our limits. That we are trying to do what is beyond our limits. And, and that's so important for us to understand because, because we as human beings have a tendency to forget that we have limits. We, we forget that, that we are limited. We live in a culture that says, Fast is good, slow is bad. We live in a culture that says you can have it all if you just work hard enough and long enough. We live in a culture that, that celebrates those who push past their limits, who, who, who way overdo it, who work their lives into the ground, and we celebrate those people who, who live at the office. You know, those are the people who get the promotions, right? And, and it's easy to get caught up in it all. But I'm, I know, and you know, that it's not good. As a matter of fact, Jethro, in our text last week, the father of Moses said, when we ignore our limits, it's not good for us, and it's not good for anybody else. It's not, it's not good. It's not good for us. And, and, and we know this. Uh, we've experienced it. When we're in a rush, usually nothing positive comes out of it. And we spent a lot of time dealing with that last week. <clears throat> but we're not just talking about rushing in traffic or, or rushing to get ready in the morning or, or rushing up on stage and forgetting to introduce yourself like I did just a minute ago. Um, we're, not, we're not talking about those things. Those things are just a metaphor for, for rushing through life, you know, rushing to get that promotion or to build that dream home or to have your family just the way that you want it. Or, or, or rushing to meet the needs of everybody around you. It's just the idea of rushing in life, living a life of rush in, in every way. And so what we're really talking about throughout this series is, is changing the way we live, finding a different way to live. And I believe the key to doing that, the key to finding a, a rhythm to life that works is focusing in on not rush, but actually rest. I believe this is the most important topic of our day because nobody rests anymore. <laughs> nobody knows what real rest is all about. And so for the next four weeks, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what it means to, to really rest. Not rest the way you think, but really rest. See, the, the bottom line for the series is you cannot rest when you are in a rush and you will not rush when you were truly at rest. And what we said last week is those things, those two things, they're just incompatible. They don't go together, which means if we want to resist the rush, we have to rest. We have to. We have to find a way to rest. And who here couldn't use a little more rest? Right? Everybody? Yep. I, hey, your spouse may be looking, so you better raise your hand, okay? <clears throat> You're not getting that nap this afternoon. I'm just saying. Like... <laughs> Everybody, all of us, we would all agree that we could use a little more rest, that it's important, that it matters, that it's an, a, a big deal, that we need it. We, we need it in our world. We live in a world that's just, that's crazy. We live in a world that's just overrun and overcome with exhaustion and, and, I, and I think about that, and I think, well, well where is the answer? Where, where can we actually find this rest that we so desperately need? And I think there is an answer, but I want to talk about where, we're, where you're not going to find it first. See, what I know is you're probably not going to find it playing on your phone, staring at your phone. See, last week we said we needed to cut some things in our life, right? Uh, we, we need to let some things go. And, but the problem with just um, doing less is that we will always find a way to refill that time. We will always add something to it. And if we're not careful, we will cut some things, and then we'll just fill it with playing on our phone. 
right? We'll just fill it with watching TV. And I'm telling you, I, I'm guilty of this. And, and, and the truth is, you go, well, isn't that rest? No, that's not rest. And you know how I know? Because I've done it. And I'm still tired. And I'm still exhausted. You know, you, 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 you've got a lot on your plate. You've got a lot on your mind. You've got a lot of things going on. You say, man, I just need to check out for a minute. I'm just going to look at my phone for a minute and just take a little break, uh, get my mind to rest. And next thing you know, an hour has gone by and you come back to reality. Are you, are you rested? No, you're in a panic because you just wasted an hour. You're more stressed than when, before the whole thing started. How about your day off? Have you ever had one of those days where it's your day off and you have some very good intentions? You have a to-do list, that some things that you know needs to get done around the house. And so your plan is, is to, to get up and um, not be in a hurry, but just kind of check some of those things off your list that day. But, you know, you're just like, man, I just need a little bit of a rest. So I'm just going to turn the TV on and, and uh, catch up on a couple of, couple of my shows. And the next thing you know, it's dark and you've been binge watching Hulu all day. Anybody been there before? At the end of that day, how do you feel? Do you feel rested? Because I don't. <laughs> I feel stressed and overwhelmed and aggravated and ticked off at myself that I just wasted an entire day. I feel more overwhelmed than I did before because I had the time to actually get the things done and I wasted it and now those things are still on the list and so now I'm more stressed and worried than I was before I supposedly rested. How about the weekends? Are the weekends a time of rest for you? For so many people, that's what the weekend is meant. You know, you work Monday through Friday, and you get the weekend off if you're lucky, right? Are the weekends a time of rest? Because if they are, that means Monday's your best day of the week. Now, how true is that for everybody in here? Because you rested all weekend, so you should be refreshed and ready to go and ready to tackle your day when you go in the office on Monday. But that's not reality for most of us, is it? <clears throat> Why is that? Well, because... We're not resting, really resting, on the weekend. What about vacation? Think about vacation. How many times have you come home from vacation thinking, I need a vacation? I need a, that is actually a saying that everybody here is familiar with. I need a vacation from my vacation, right? See, we go on vacation and we're just as tired when we get back. And see, what I've learned is, is that sitting in front of the TV or, or playing on my phone or even uh, uh, having a, 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 a supposedly restful weekend or vacation, doing those things, it's not really rest if you come home or you come back to life just as tired as you were before. How could that be rest? It's either not enough which is often the case. That's how often those things make us feel. But, but what I've learned is those things aren't really rest. They're just distraction. They're, they're just an escape from life. See, distraction isn't resting. It's temporarily escaping. And isn't that what we do when we veg out in front of the TV? We just want to shut our brains off. When we're, when we're scrolling through our phone or looking at social media, watching dumb videos on YouTube or, or playing Candy Crush. What are we doing? We're just, we're just escaping. We're just, we're just, I, I, I just got so much on my mind that I just need to escape, escape for a little while. The problem is we come back and we're not rested. We're still tired. We're still overwhelmed. That is not real rest. It is just a distraction. It is just an escape. Which is why so many of us are exhausted. Which is why what we see in our world to be true is that people, what do we see? What, what is a familiar picture of our world? People living for the weekend, right? People who, who hate their jobs and they just look forward to the weekend. But the weekend is never long enough, so they go back to work and what are they looking forward to again? <laughs> The weekend, living for the weekend, often aided by what? Drugs and alcohol, right? Because that's the only time they have peace. We also see people who are just consumed with their hobbies. Because their hobbies is the only place in their life that they have peace. I know it. I mean, I know some Alabama fans. I'm just saying. That was supposed to be a joke. Sorry. <laughs> um, just people who are just consumed, so consumed with their hobbies. They don't care about anything else, just this hobby. Because it's the only time in their life that they can escape enough and, and find a little bit of peace. 
We see that in our world. We see people who are just literally wasting their life away in, with their face in their phone or wasting their life away um, uh, uh, in front of the television. We see people who are miserable at work, hating their jobs, with people miserable at home because they're exhausted all the time. And we, we got to be thinking there must be a better way. And surely we as Jesus followers, if you're a Christian in this room, we, we know a better way. That isn't describing us, is it? The, st- the statistics say we're just as guilty as anybody else. When they take averages and they survey the country and they find out that 2,000, the average American, including Christians, touches their phone 2,617 times a day. That's that ex- escape drawing you in. That the average American spends almost seven hours a day looking at a screen for non-work-related reasons. Seven hours, either on your phone or in front of a television or at a computer or in front of a gaming system. Seven hours a day. And we Christians, we're not bringing that average down very much. You know, the, the, the idea that the average American spends $300 a month on entertainment. On entertainment. And that's if you exclude expensive hobbies and expensive vacations. 300 a month. And again, we're all guilty of it. We, we are right in the middle of it. We're not, as followers of Jesus, not bringing down the average. But I hope that you believe that there is a better way than just living our lives, filling ourselves with distraction, and being miserable any time that we're not distracted. There's got to be a better way. And I think that we are called to be a part of the solution. And I think in order to know that solution, we've got to go to God's Word and see what it says about real rest, not distraction. That's what I want to do today. We're going to start today in John 10.10. It's a very popular verse. I know that probably most everybody in this room has heard it before. I'm going to read it to you. It says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You've heard that before, right? God wants us to have a full life. However, we have an enemy, the thief, who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is that thief? I just named him. The enemy, the devil, Satan, right? That's who this is referring to. And the thing about it is that Satan, he comes in many different forms. In this parable, where where in John 10.10, the parable that Jesus is is telling of the good shepherd, the the enemy is actually coming in the form of, of the legalism of the Pharisees. He, he's coming in the form of religion. And he's saying, religion, legalism is trying to steal, kill, and destroy you. Destroy what, though? Well, your life. It's trying to destroy your life. But he doesn't just come through religion, right? Couldn't he just as easily come? As a matter of fact, I think with technology, he said, hey, I found a better way. I know how to steal your life. I'll put a personal computer in your pocket that will buzz at you all day long. Every time you have a free moment to think, and I will still kill and destroy your life. And see, you may be sitting here and you don't believe in the devil because you're not a religious person and you don't believe in Jesus, but you know good and well that phone has the ability to still kill and destroy your life. You know the television does. You know hobbies, when we're consumed by them, can still kill and destroy our lives. We know that living for the weekend can still kill and destroy our lives. We know this. We, we know that that is true. But I am a Christian, and I believe we do have a very real enemy. I believe that there is a devil, and he has a purpose. The, script, the Bible says that he is smart, and that he is cunning, and that this is his mission. And so we should be looking for him, We should be looking for how he is trying to take our life. Corey Tan Boone said this. She said, if the devil can't make you sin, he will make you busy. If the devil can't make you sin, he will make you busy. Now, why in the world would the devil want to make you busy? Why would the devil want to make you distracted? What is his goal? What is his purpose? What is he thinking? Well, sin, busyness, and distraction have the same effect. They cut off our connection to God and other people. See, as Christians, we know we're not supposed to do this one. 
right? Sin is bad. But we don't normally put busyness and distraction in the same category, do we? But maybe we should because they all have the same effect. They cut off our connection to God and they cut off our connection to other people. That's what the enemy wants. He wants us to be cut off from God and he wants us to be cut off from each other. But what does God want? He wants us to have abundant life, right? That's what he said. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. What, that, that's, that's where we started, John 10.10. 10. Well, what does that look like? Well, Jesus said, he, he, he told us exactly what to do. He, he, when they asked Jesus, what is the greatest command? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. To love God with all your heart, heart, soul, mind, and strength, that requires a connection. That, that requires not being distracted. That requires attention. To love people well requires all the same thing. See, a full and abundant life is a life of love. It's a life of, of, of loving God and loving people. It's a life of being loved by God and being loved by people. That's what it's all about. Now, you may, that sounds a little corny. I get it. But it's just the truth. If you're living it, you know it. There's nothing better than this. That's what full and abundant life is. It, it is a life of love. It's the reason we're here. It's the reason we do this every single week. It's because we are motivated by love. We are motivated by our love for God. We are motivated by our love for people. That's, that should be the motivation of every follower of Jesus from the moment we wake up in the morning till we go to bed at night. This, this heart of how can I love God more? How can I love people more? How can I know love more? But it's very, very difficult to do that when you are exhausted and distracted. We can't be who it is that we were made to be when we are exhausted and distracted. There's got to be a better way. And thankfully, we don't have to look very far to find it. See, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he was stepping into an exhausted and distracted world. He was stepping into a world with people who were worn down by life's hardships. He was stepping into a world of, uh, uh, filled with people who were... Uh, worn out by the hypocrisy of religion. And he said, I've come to bring and to teach you a better way. One of his greatest invitations to the better way comes at the end of chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 11. And this is what Jesus says. And again, it's a verse I'm sure you're all familiar with. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's an incredible passage, so beautifully, so beautifully written. It, 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 it says everything that needs to be said there. And studying it this week, and I was reminded again of Eugene Peterson's uh, uh, The Message Commentary version. And I just wanted to share that with you this morning because I think it even gives uh, a fuller depth of, of what Jesus is saying here. He says, he says, are you tired? Are you worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Doesn't that sound amazing? Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that who Jesus was? It's absolutely incredible. You know, what I love about Eugene Peterson's commentary of this is he helps us to see something that you may read right over. Often we go to Matthew 
11, 28, and we just say, hey, you got to go to Jesus when you're tired. And that is, that is absolutely true. That's, that's the big part of what this verse is all about. But we can't stop there. This verse says, come to me when you're tired, and you'll find rest, and, and I'll teach you something. There's something to learn here. Come to me when you're tired and you'll find rest. And then you can watch and you can learn a new rhythm of life from me. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch what I do. And then learn the unforced rhythms of grace. There's something to learn from Jesus and the way that he lived. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, come to me and I will teach you a new way to live. Jesus, he was the ultimate example of the abundant life. He, he, look, whether you're a Jesus follower or not, whether you're religious or not, you have to admire the guy. When you read the Gospels, you just come across th this very special human being. Even other world religions can't deny that Jesus was just a, he was a pretty incredible dude. It's undeniable when you read his stories, when you read the way he, that he saw life. But when you think about also how he approached life, Jesus was never in a rush. He always took time to be with the people that he was with. It's incredible. When, when Jairus' daughter is sick and dying and he comes and he said, Jesus, I need you, my daughter. She's on death's bed. Jesus is on the way. And he and he gets touched by a woman who's been suffering for 14 years, and he stops. He's not in a rush. She, was, she would have lived. But Jesus turns, and he gives this woman his attention, and he heals her. Right? The same with his friend Lazarus. The scripture says that, that Lazarus was dying, and Jesus knew, and it says he stayed two more days to preach the good news. Before he went to Lazarus, he just was never in a rush. And he, and, and he was never overwhelmed. He was never overtaken by the incredible task that he had been given of saving the world. <laughs> Pretty incredible. You know, people found out that Jesus could heal, and he literally would have to hide out because so many people were coming to him. Yet he was never rude. He, he never was overwhelmed by the crowds. He always had compassion. And he was always present there with them in the moment. You know, and in the midst of, of, of saving the world and, and in the midst of preaching the good news of the gospel, and in the midst of training up his disciples, in the midst of healing people, Jesus also had a lot of great times. He had a lot of fun. We see in scripture again and again him, him going to a party, right? We also see him having long dinners with wine and great friends. He knew how to enjoy life to the point that the Pharisees actually called him a glutton and a drunkard. Sounds to me like Jesus was having a good time, right? He enjoyed life. But what I love the most when I, when I think about the lifestyle of Jesus is just how he was just, he was always present in the moment. He wasn't thinking about what he had to do next or where he had to be. He was just there, present with whoever was with him. And he loved people well, and he, and he gave them their time. And he was the kind of guy that you would have wanted to be friends with. You would have wanted to be friends with Jesus. You would have wanted to have this guy close to you because he just had a special way about him. He had, the, he had this ability to be serious and, and authoritative and, and very mission-focused. And at the very same time, he was light and joyful, and free. Somehow, he, he found a way to, to be both, to, to do the job and, and the work that he had come here to do, but also to really just enjoy life. So how did he do it? How, how did Jesus pull it off? Because if we can figure out how Jesus pulled it off, then we can have that too. We can have a life that we don't need to escape from. We can have a life that, that is full and abundant where we can be present in the moment with people and love people well and, and love God well. But we, we've got to follow Jesus' model. Well, Jesus gives us the answer. He says it again and again. But in John chapter 6, he makes it clear. The, the thing that he did is the very thing that he's asking us to do. See, in John 6, it says this. It says, 
I lost the slide somehow. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. Um, G- what it says is that Jesus submitted to someone else's plan and he followed their way. In John 6, Jesus says this, For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus has called all of us to submit to him and to follow his way, but that's not something he's unfamiliar with. Jesus says, come to me and I will teach you the way. He knew what to do. He knows what to show us because that's the exact same thing that he did. He came and he submitted to the Father and he followed the Father's way, which is why he always knew where to be. It wasn't his plan. It it was God's plan. It wasn't his will. It was God's will. The reason some of you are so tired and exhausted right now is because you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you have refused to give him the authority of your life. You're you're pulling back and pushing against him. You are not following. You're trying to lead. When they would yoke two ox together, they'd put a mature, strong ox with a younger, immature ox. And the idea was just that the mature, strong ox would carry the load and he would teach the younger ox the way. But if the younger ox refused to follow the lead of the older ox, guess what? He ended up carrying the burden. He ended up being the one who was weighed down and worn out. And if that's you, and and you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you're still trying to be in control of your life, you're going to find yourself just like that young ox, worn out because you're carrying a load that you were never meant to carry. See, real rest begins with submission. You have to submit to Jesus. You have to say, not my way, God, but your way. If you want to find rest, you've got to stop fighting it. Real rest begins with submission. I want to be more specific, though, because sometimes we hear something like that, and it's like, okay, that's awesome. So I'm going to make this a little bit more practical for you this morning. Real rest begins with submitting your schedule to God and committing to follow his, his plan for your life. The hardest thing for us to submit is our time. It's one of the most difficult things for us to give up. But that's what J- Jesus is calling us to do. We have to submit our schedules to God and we have to commit to following his plan for our life. Last week I said that you guys I challenge you guys to go home and look at your schedules and decide to do less, right? Decide that you need to cut some things. And I've already said it. The problem with just stopping right there is that you're just going to fill your time with something else. So you can't stop there. There's something else that you've got to do. You've got to reprioritize. You've got to take everything that's left after you've done the cutting and you've got to decide what's most important and what's least important. And not based on what you want, but based on the person that you have submitted your life to. You have to prioritize your life God's way. So, you, so I'm challenging you once again. Take the things that are left and say, how do I prioritize in a way that God would prioritize? I asked Grady to let me borrow this. I used to have one of these, and I, I know y'all can't see that from way out there, but you, might, you probably could almost tell me what it is, even from a long distance, right? It says WWJD. If you grew up in the 90s, you know all about this, right? You have them string halfway up your arm, right? Because uh, you need to hear it over and over again. It's like, oh, yeah, let me read it one more time. Let me read it one more time, right? Like, what would Jesus do? Well, well I want to... I want to change this a little bit because this helps us make individual decisions. But, but we're talking about reordering our lives here. And so I want to come up with a new one. And I, and I came up with this. H-W-J-L. Anybody have any clue what that stands for? How would Jesus live? How would Jesus live if he were me? Jesus wasn't a dad. But how would he live if he was a dad? 
Jesus wasn't a husband, but how would Jesus live if he was a husband? He, clearly, he wasn't a wife either, right? How would he live? How would Jesus live if he lived in the same community his entire life? How would he live if he ran a business? How would he live if he had to provide for a family? How would Jesus live? You see, Jesus lived a very different life than many of us, right? He, he was a nomad. He didn't have children. Um, he didn't have a wife. He, he, he traveled the world with nothing but the shirt on his back. But he's not asking us to live that way. That's not what he's asking of us. So instead of, of abandoning your family, you know, he's not saying, hey, abandon your family and, and sell everything you have and travel the world with nothing but the shirt on your back. That's not what he's asking of us. So instead of doing that, instead of trying to jump into Jesus' shoes, how about you put Jesus in your shoes? And you ask this question, how would Jesus live if he were me? How would Jesus live if he had my job? How would Jesus live if he was in my circumstance? How would he live? What, what choices would he make? How would he prioritize his life? Would Jesus continue to work at this job that has these incredible demanding hours? Would Jesus have his kid in six extracurricular activities that has him running all over town six or seven days a week? Would Jesus sacrifice his time to live in that dream home or to remodel that perfectly good home? Would, would Jesus... spend his weekends wearing it out and be miserable five days a week. Here's the thing. I, I can't answer this for you. We're all in different places in life. We're in different seasons. I've got little kids to raise. Some of you, your kids are grown, so you're just trying to help raise your grandkids, right? Some of you uh, um, are trying to take care of your elderly parents. Some of you are in retirement. Some of you are just getting started in, in your career. Some of you um, are financially stable. Some of you have a mountain of debt. So I cannot answer these questions for you. That is not my goal. My goal is for you to ask these questions yourself. How would Jesus live if he were me? What would his priorities be if he were me? What would his life look if he were me? And this should be a challenge for us. And here's the thing, guys. This series, I, I, my, my heart is that we would be challenged because I think a lot of us need to make some big changes. I'm not talking about little changes. I'm talking about big changes. And I don't mean it has to happen all at one time, but I mean we got to start moving in that direction. We've got to change the, the trajectory of our life. God, if we, church, if we want to share the gospel, we've got to do something different. And this is where it starts. We've got to quit living the same as the rest of the world. We've, we've got to do it different. How would Jesus live if he were me? How would he spend his time? Who would he give his attention to? What would he do for his community? What would he do for his church? Again, I, I can't answer those questions for your individual lives, but I know if we all tried this, there would be one thing that would be at the top of every single person's list. You know what would be at the top of every one of our lists if we were trying to live like Jesus? Time with God. Jesus prioritized above everything else time with God. Always. Always. You would find Jesus. You know, with Jesus man, healing is going on. Miracles are taking place. Crowds have gathered. People are excited and they're like, where'd Jesus go? Oh, he's with God. He went away to be with God. And we know that this is important. We know that we're supposed to read our Bibles. We know we're supposed to have some quiet time or we, we spend time in the presence of God each day. And, you know, because our pastor told us that's what we're supposed to do. But how many of you really understand the significance of it? Because I, I, I honestly want to say that we're all guilty of time with God not being the top thing on our list, aren't we? Even though we know that it should be. Well, why is our time so important to God? Why does he even care about our schedules? You ever thought about that before? Why is it so important to him that we make room in our lives for him? 
Well, it's, it's, it's for the same reason that the devil wants to distract us. Because time with God is when we have the opportunity to connect with him. See, he, he, he has made us to need him. <laughs> he has created us. Our greatest limit is that we need him. Eternally, we need him. We need his presence all the time. That is our greatest need. There is no greater need to that. And, and so unless we're in his presence, we're not resting. See, real rest is found in the presence of God. Real, real rest is found in the, in the presence of God. Jesus understood this. He understood. You know, think about this. I, and I have this theory. It's, it's not the work in our life that wears us out, right? Work is hard. You know, I've, I've cut grass for 20 years now in Alabama heat. The work is hard. But you know what's so much worse than the work? The worry about the work. It's, it's so much worse. The worry that I'm going to disappoint somebody or that I'm not going to have, provide for my family well enough or just that, that, that I'm not enough or that there isn't enough. Um, it's just the worry. It's this all-consuming thing. And it's not just work. It's everything uh, in life. You, you, just, you have these thoughts that run through your head all day long. Am I enough? Am I good enough? Am I a good enough mother? Am I a good enough father? Am I a good enough employee? Am I, am I a good enough business owner? Uh, are we going to make it? Is there something I can fix? Uh, do, do I have the strength to fix it? Um, what can I do? How can I do it? And they run through our mind. And when those things are running through our mind, what do we want to do? We want to escape. And the devil said, I got a way. Let me just put this screen in front of you and it'll all go away. He's the one putting it in our head in the first place. He says, oh, I'll fix that for you. Because he knows in the presence of God, those things begin to melt away. And see, in the presence of God, we are reminded that we are enough. Not because of what we do, but because of who he says that we are. In the presence of God, we are reminded that we are not the one in charge, that he is the one in charge. See, escaping will never help us because we're going to have to come back to those issues at some point or another. But God has offered us a better way. He says, you don't have to escape them. You can just overcome them by knowing who you are, knowing that you are a child of God, knowing that I love you, knowing that I'm in control and that everything is going to be okay despite how it may feel or look in the moment. By knowing that I am here with you, that you are never alone, that you can't fix it, but that I can. All of those happen, things happen in the presence of our God. He, he reminds us that you are my child, and with you I am well pleased. And in that moment, all of those worries, they begin to melt away. And so when Jesus was tired and worn out, in Mark chapter 1, we, we, we see his, his first day of ministry. And he has an incredible day. He preaches the gospel. He preaches the kingdom has come near. Um, he, he, he's, he's gathering a crowd. He goes to Peter's house for some dinner. He heals Peter's mother. They have an incredible dinner. He, he's already healed some people. Word has gotten out, and now people are gathered at the door. It's dark. It's time for bed. There's no electricity. But people are lined up out the door for healing, and Jesus has compassion on them. He heals through the night. And the very next line says, that Jesus took a nap and he slept all day. No, <laughs> that's not what it says. And, and it is that, well, Jesus finally got tired and he, he got aggravated and told him to get out and come back tomorrow. Or Jesus put a sign on the door that said, I went on vacation. I'll be back next week. The very next line says, Jesus, after this incredibly long, and you can only imagine exhausting day, went to be alone, got up early. He went to bed late. If he went to bed at all, and he got up early, and he went to be with God. Because he knew that's where real rest would be found. Not, not sleeping in, not laying on the beach, not going on vacation, but in the presence of God is where he would find rest. And the same is true for us. I'm not against vacations. I'm not against going to the beach. I'm not against watching television. Actually, I love it. I got a 65-inch that I sit about six feet away from. I love it, okay? I'm not against those things. But it's not rest if you're just doing it to escape. 
And we don't need to escape our lives because God has promised us a full and abundant life. But the only way that you can have a full and abundant life, a life that you don't want to escape from, is if you intentionally spend time in the presence of God. And here's what's incredible about the presence of God is that we don't have to leave it. It goes with us. See, in order to rest, we don't need to escape, escape our life. What we need to escape is the distractions that are keeping us from experiencing the presence of God in our life. God's presence is always with us. We can have rest in the midst. Guys, think about it. Think about it. Matthew 8. There is a storm about to turn the boat over. The disciples are in chaos. And what is Jesus doing? He's sleeping. How could he do that? Because he was always at rest, because he was always in the presence of the Father. He trusted. He knew it was going to be okay. He knew, even in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of your chaos, you can know it's going to be okay as long as you know the presence of God with you. As a matter of fact, in that story, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the disciples. You're like, man, you were kind of tough on them. They were just scared for their life. And he's like, you're not in control of your life. I'm in control of your life. So you can rest. And here's the thing. Jesus can call us to, 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 to model the, his lifestyle, to, to be present in the moment, to, to not rush, to, to not go slow. Um, and, and, and we can get, gain a lot. We can gain a lot from that. But he didn't just say, learn what I do. He said, I am rest. See, he didn't just come to teach us a way to live. He came to give us life. And the way that he did that is by giving his life. Jesus gave his life for your life so that you could forever be in the presence of God, so that you could forever be at rest, both now and into the future. All you have to do is receive it. Would you pray with me? Father, man, this is such a powerful reminder. Lord, my heart is burdened for your church. My heart is burdened for the individuals listening to this message. God, I pray that we could just get it. Lord, that, that your presence is all that we need, Lord, and that you offer it to us all the time, that we don't have to be miserable ever. We don't have to be miserable at work. We don't have to be miserable um, in, in, in difficult circumstances, God, because you are there with us, God. And so I pray, my heart is that, that we would adapt the lifestyle, God, that, that makes room to be recognized that, to know that, God. Father, that we as believers would find a new way to live, God, so that we can model it to the world and say, we know a better way. You don't have to live exhausted. You don't have to live tired. You don't have to live distracted. You can have a full and abundant life. And all you have to do is put your trust in Jesus. And God, for the believers in this room, I pray that we would make room in our lives and that we would prioritize our lives in such a way that we are reminded of that all day long, every single day. Help us to do that, Lord. And Father, for the person here who doesn't know you, who has never um, made you the Lord of their life, God, I pray that they would have the courage to do that today. God, that they would yoke themselves to you today. God, that they would learn what it is to have their burdens lifted. God, that they would learn the peace that comes when you are the one that is in control. The peace that comes when they have life in you. It's an incredible, incredible gift, God. Father, give them the courage right now to make that decision. If that's you today, it's as simple as making a decision. Just, just say, Jesus, I've tried doing this life on my own, and all I end up being is tired, worn out, distracted, looking for an escape. And I'm tired. I'm tired of running to the TV. I'm tired of running to my phone. I'm tired of running to drugs and alcohol. I'm tired of running to sex. I'm tired of running to money. I'm tired of running to the things of this world because the harder I run, the harder it gets. And so today, God, I'm just going to run to you. And I'm going to give you my life. And 
I'm going to trust and submit to your will for my life. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.